Speaking of Apple, my next guest says absurd valuations in that company and other big fang names is leading to a transition in leadership from tech to other sectors like financials and energy, especially with bond yields doing what they are today. But should investors resist the temptation? Let's welcome in David Bonson. He's the chief investment officer at the Bonson Group. David, welcome. I guess I asked the question because I wonder if financials and energy are the kind of sectors that can give you a couple good quarters, but technology is sort of where you make the big gains in the long run. Well, I, I think that there's a couple of different arguments there. I, I believe cyclically you've seen whole decades where technology made a ton of money and whole decades where it made no money. So we know what happened in the 90s and we know what happened in the decade following. The Nasdaq took 16 years to recover. Some big tech names still haven't recovered from its 1999 pricing. So we want to look at it company by company, but across the whole sector, there's been huge growth both of earnings and of the multiple in much of the technology sector. Financials and energy have been great performers for decades as well, but they've run into cyclical patches. The financial crisis was the big one in financials, and energy's now had its big issue. Uh, I believe that's played out. I think that right now the bad news and then some was priced in and that there are a lot of opportunities in the energy sector that are going to make sense for more than just a couple of quarters. Tell me where those are. Are they in specific stocks or would people be fine with kind of broad sector exposure? And what's the catalyst? You know, we're obviously seeing it already. Ten years at one point six percent. Financials and energy have been strong performers uh, in recent weeks. Um, do we need two percent on the 10 year? No, I, I do understand why a lot of the big banks benefit from higher net interest margin. But if there's one thing we've seen with a lot of the financial sector, it's that it is not merely a net interest margin story. Uh, when you look at a company like J.P. Morgan, which we own and have owned for 10 years now, it's grown its dividend 500 percent since the financial crisis. That's an investment bank. That's a, a trading franchise. Um, a company like Goldman Sachs, which we don't own, has absolutely uh, no net interest margin exposure relative to their tr trading and their wealth management business and investment banking. So I think that there's a lot of different ways to play financials. And the yield curve shape is one, but it is not the only one. When you see industrial production miss like it did this morning, prices doing what they are, consumer sentiment weak, uh, what do you make of stagflation and the fact that maybe energy's doing well? That's a bad thing. You know, it slows the economy. Financials doing well. Well, not if, you know, not if the consumer balance sheet isn't looking quite as good as we think because of all this sort of excess cash. You know, what happens if this is not as pleasant an environment as we thought it might have been a couple months ago? Well, I think we like to look at some of these monthly economic data points on rolling three-month averages, and none of them really look that bad when we do that. Some of them could get worse. I'm concerned going into next year on business confidence, on industrial production, but particularly uh, CapEx, that non-residential fixed investment, which is so crucial in GDP growth. Uh, we basically got almost none of it in the years following the financial crisis, in a couple of years following the Trump tax cuts, it really picked up a lot. But I think that post-COVID, there's a question mark as to what the business investment world will look like. But I really do believe that we have the opportunity for an extension of this economic expansion. But there's policy issues that, that kind of stand in the way there. Yeah. I think the energy story is more of a value story around mispricing. Basically, Kelly, a lot of bad news that was fully priced in and a lot of good news that wasn't. And that's the type of thing we like to look for uh, in investing. So what if I said to you, give me the place to go in the market, David, where I don't want to be in technology. I don't want to be in high valuations. I'm ner I don't necessarily want to be in energy. Maybe I'm a little nervous about financial. So I'm ruling a lot of things out. Is there anywhere I can go to kind of quote unquote, protect myself? Sure. I'll give you a sector answer, even though we're not top down investors, we're bottom up pickers. And, and as you know, we're kind of biased towards dividend growth. But the one sector that is never the worst performing and never the best performing, but I think is always in that middle ground of good fundamentals, relatively low valuations compared to other sectors is consumer staples. Hmm. It also happens to be extremely non-cyclical. People still buy laundry detergent, diapers, paper towels, 
you know, a lot of these consumer food products, regardless of economic activity. So if that's the, the setup, you know, in the question, consumer staples are always that kind of, you know, not too hot, not too cold type of place to be. And there happens to be great dividend growing names when you look at Pepsi, Procter Gamble, Kimberly Clark, all of which are names that we own. The boring is beautiful uh, kind of trade, yes. if we want to call it that. David, thanks so much. We appreciate it today. David Bonson with the Bonson Group. Yeah.